Hi, everyone. My name is Emma Lewis, and I completed my practicum at the Montreal Public Health Department. Before starting this master's, I was working as an occupational therapist, OT, in a rehabilitation facility with seniors who had various health issues. One thing that struck me in my work was the difference not only in health outcomes, but where this person could go to after they were discharged, so home or long-term care, depended so much on their social network or whether they had one or not. So this led me to take an interest into the issue of isolation and loneliness in this public health master's. And I really felt as though the stars aligned for me when it came to this practicum, because not only does my supervisor work to promote senior social participation, she also has a professional background in occupational therapy. So when I expressed an interest in combining my OT knowledge with my new skills in public health, she suggested that I explore the topic of occupational justice and how it could be applied to public health and social policy. So today, I'm going to be introducing to you the Occupational Justice Framework, a novel policy tool that will give you a different lens with which to view a policy problem. And by applying the Occupational Justice Framework to the topic of social participation in seniors, we'll see that social participation is a right that could be promoted via public policy. So for today's presentation, I'll be giving a few definitions to lay the groundwork before introducing the Occupational Justice Framework, and I'll then walk through the framework using a couple of case studies. I'll finish by outlining the recommendations and conclusions that stem from the literature review and qualitative research analysis I completed during my practicum. So I just mentioned a couple of these, but these are a quick overview of the deliverables I completed during my practicum, which included a literature review on occupational justice. This is where I learned about the framework. And then I applied it to my qualitative research study, which was um, the manuscript was uh, my culminating report. So before I go any further, I want to get everyone on the same page as to what exactly an occupation is. There can be misconceptions that it refers to work or employment. It can, but it's so much larger than that. Occupations are all the things you do in a day to occupy your time. So it can be the things you need to do, eat and get dressed, you want to do, travel or take up a hobby, or that you're expected to do. Work can fall in here. Research demonstrates that engagement in meaningful occupation leads to increases in various health outcomes, including cognitive, physical, and psychosocial functioning, as well as overall quality of life. So in other words, it's good for our health to be engaged in various occupations. The next concept that I want to define is social participation. This is an important dimension of occupation. It refers to people's involvement and interaction with others. This could be their family, their local community, and wider society. Here, a large body of research demonstrates the benefits of promoting senior social participation, as it's been shown to decrease cardiovascular morbidity, slow cognitive decline, reduce medication use, decrease hospital visits and frontline professional consultations, reduce depressive symptoms, and increase reported quality of life. Social participation can therefore be viewed as a major determinant of health and one of the pillars of healthy aging. The final concept that I want to go over with you is the theory that underlies the occupational justice framework. Both the theory and the framework were established in the late 1990s with the agenda to spur occupational therapists to take action against injustices pertaining to occupation in their practice. Um, occupational justice refers to the right to have access to occupations that are both meaning and meaningful and valued. So now, with the knowledge that occupational engagement promotes health and quality of life, that social participation is a valued dimension of occupation, and that it too promotes health and quality of life, we can see why this theory would align itself well with the issue of senior social participation. So here we have the visual representation of the occupational justice framework. The strength of this framework is its ability to identify and describe a policy issue. So I want to direct your attention to the far right. We have occupational outcomes, which are divided into rights and injustices. And occupational justice theory holds that individuals have the right to meaning, participation, choice, and balance. However, if these rights are denied, it leads to one or a combination of injustices called imbalance, marginalization, deprivation, and alienation. I'll go through the definitions with you. Occupational imbalance is when an individual is either understimulated and has too little to do, or the person is involved in too many occupations that have been imposed on them. It's the opposite of occupational balance. Occupational marginalization is when an individual lacks the power to exercise occupational choice because they are stigmatized by a certain characteristic like illness or disability. Occupational deprivation is the result of, an, of individuals being denied opportunity and resources to participate in occupations. And alienation occurs when people are required to participate in occupations they find meaningless or little recognition or reward. So to analyze an issue with this framework, you first identify your outcome, and then your task is to work your way back to identify the factors that contributed to this outcome. It's the combination of both structural and contextual factors that lead to a specific occupational outcome. 
And once these outcomes and factors have been identified, it's then that targeted strategies can be considered to address the injustices. And if we want to bring this into public health terms, if we look at the examples under the, each factors, we can see factors that relate to the social determinants of health, like housing, education, and employment, as well as risk factors like age, gender, and income. So help, to help illustrate the framework, I've developed okay, uh, two case studies based on the focus groups I analyzed. Personal details were changed for confidentiality purposes, and I'd like you now to meet Judith. Judith recently moved to a private senior's residential facility with her husband, who has Parkinson's. They made the decision to move because of his declining health and limited home care support. She had progressively had to reduce her activities to take care of her husband, and she's been given a couple hours a week of respite, but this time is used up to do errands, like getting the week's groceries, and because of poor access to services where they now live. And Judith only can walk because public transportation is difficult, and it was her husband who used to drive, but he had to give up his uh, driver's license after his Parkinson's progressed. The couple have two adult children who live in the U.S., and they speak to them regularly on the phone. And she said that despite spending her time with her husband and being surrounded by many people in the residence, she feels isolated and alone and distressed by the fact that she has to assume all the household duties. So if we look at the occupational justice framework, we can see that Judith is experiencing at least two occupational injustices. She's experiencing imbalance due to her caregiving duties, and she's also experiencing deprivation because in the free time she is allocated, she's limited to doing errands due to logistics around transportation. We can also see that lack of close family or friends may exacerbate these injustices and the imbalance. So her case highlights issues related to service provision for her husband as well as herself, uh, transportation and accessibility, and I'm sure you're thinking of other examples of things that can improve her quality of life. Next we have Simon, he doesn't look too happy. Um, I'd like you to meet Simon. He retired early from his job as a construction worker after suffering a heart attack. He lives at home with his wife and they can take care of their grandchildren twice a week. He had to give up his favorite activity of jogging and manual labor tasks around the house, as he notices he just doesn't have the energy. He says he feels the pressure from society to be quicker and more efficient. He's experiencing the injustice of alienation because he's began isolating himself through a pattern of self-exclusion because he feels he doesn't fit with society's standards for successful aging. His feelings of alienation call for a need to broaden our vision of what it means to age, especially with limitations, and to challenge our possible our adherence to the gold standard of a senior who's active and involved in society. So based on the literature view of occupational justice and the analysis of focus groups that I conducted, I didn't correct the focus groups, but I conducted the analysis, uh, I was able to draw a few conclusions on both how the occupational justice framework could be used in public health, as well as when it is applied to the senior population, what can be done to promote their social participation. So first, we can integrate the notions of occupational justice framework into existing public health and policy frameworks. We can do this by using the occupational justice language and terminology, like injustices, rights, structural and contextual factors, and the framework can be used on its own in public policy by identifying the policy problem. Okay. Next, when developing policies to promote social participation, there are a few things that can be done. Uh, occupational justice encourages consulting seniors' opinion during policy development. This includes including the vice voices of the most vulnerable. This promotes the right of participation and reduces the injustice of deprivation. We need to acknowledge the diversity in occupations amongst older adults, and considering that there are large variations in age, beliefs, values, interests, and reflecting, reflecting this in policy promotes meaning and reduces alienation. We need to revisit what it means to age successfully, say by keeping active and actually staving off illness and disability, by challenging ageist perceptions of older adults and, adults, and helping to provide acceptance and existence for different ways people will age, and therefore allow for more choice in occupations and reduce marginalization. And above all, instead of seeing social participation as secondary to other activities, we need to view it as a determinant of health and as a right to which all persons should have access to and have this affirmed through public policy. So thank you so much. I want to thank um, my supervisor, Valérie Lemieux, Trevor, and Akin Gabi, who were really instrumental in coordinating my practicum, Nigel and Kathy, who helped get me my ethics application for my research project, and last but finally not least, my supportive family who really saw me through multiple events during this master's. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Show of hands for how many of you felt like you had occupational injustices when you were looking at that slide. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Any questions?
Thanks for that presentation, Emma. I'm just wondering in the research if you came across any um, ways to prevent those ageist attitudes that you had in your conclusion and recommendations. Um, one of the things that actually I found interesting was I read an article uh, that was talking about how we talk about aging. And sometimes we think it's good to be having like a positive aging discourse. So um, we used to view people as frail, elderly, but actually seeing them as like sort of active and engaged in their society, we actually need to be careful of how we use both of these terms. Because if we sort of say, it's only really good to be doing a certain way, volunteering a lot, being active, some people just don't necessarily see themselves reflected in this. So I think um, it's just really to sort of see that like all types of personalities and people and how they live, just to be reflected in this, helps to reduce sort of ageist attitudes and to be cognizant of just that the people are going to be aging in many different ways. Thanks very much. It's such an interesting topic, and I have aging parents, and I think about this with my parents, but it seems like so much that sometimes one event, like a um, maybe a, a fall or an injury, can mm -hmm. lead to another challenge in that person's life, and there's this cumulative effect of, of moving towards greater social isolation, and it may be not a choice, but something that has happened that triggers other events, and so how do we, how does the healthcare system, in your view, help to counteract that, or what have you maybe read about that um, can be, you know, help to mitigate these risks of this cumulative effect? And yeah. well, you're, yes, you're pointing out something that is definitely in the literature is that it's really life transitions that put people more at risk for both loneliness and social isolation, and that's why. We can feel these uh, across our lifespan, but because elderly are more exposed to loss and needing to move or transition, they're more likely to be at risk for these types of things. And, but what's actually quite positive is the reasons that we put in place are often quickly readily used by this population. So say, for example, people want to be socially engaged, but quickly if they fall into the cracks of after these life transitions, so I think it's for healthcare providers to be really aware of the amount and the types of transitions that uh, can cause sort of these issues. And then it also depends to the fact that, um, to what extent a person is either isolated or lonely, uh, it, the types of interventions will change. Do you need one-on-one -on -one support? Or can you just be suggested to go to a group? It really, there's a really targeted strategies that need to be done based on the person's profile. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm scanning the room and seeing no more. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. Thank you.